the history of the 19th century america abounds with disputes and conflicts the northern regions of america were moving towards a capitalist economy whereas the southern regions were still entrenched in a slave based plantation economy the two systems were poles apart yet they existed within a single nation naturally there were undercurrents of tension within the nation dr chitta brutto palit begins his discourse on sectional conflict with a heart wrenching account of inhumanity faced by the southern slaves mainly cotton plantation apart from that there was the tobacco plantation and finally the sugar cane plantation all these plantations of the south they needed a uh, labor intensive uh, performance that means under the tropical sun the laborers had to slog for long hours almost 12 hours a day and not much brain was needed in this operation it was just the labor that was needed physical labor that was the main thing so these slaves were ideally suited for that kind of economy and they would work in the plantations without any murmur of protest just like human beasts they would do that and that gave prosperity to united states because cotton sold all over the world but thereafter while referring to the text of political economy of the slavery by eugene genovis dr palit tells so us that the condition of the, the southern slaves was not as miserable as it perceived because they had a lot of compensation genovis in his book which was an oral history of slaves in pre civil war america records that many of them confessed that though there were hardship in their life they valued their complete security of food and shelter and many of the even admitted that the masters of the plantations the gentlemen farmers or not that very harsh many of them were quite kind they were like they had a parental filial relationship many of them when they grew older they were kept as bodyguards servants of the master assistants to all his work and women they were made into housekeepers then governesses and they controlled the household of the master the condition was not that bad so it's a, as i said it, it's a kind of mixed bag the minus points but there are also plus points dr palit then tells us about the free labor of the north now these people they had all come from the continent from the old world they were the landless peasants mostly irish polish french peasants who had come there and they were engaged as farm labor mostly by the giant farm owners of the north and they are also engaged by the big merchants tycoons uh in the port cities and um people who are shippers mostly or retailers of merchandise brought from the other side of the world these people had also low wages they had hearth and home no doubt but they had low wages and they were not very gently treated by their masters after all they had to also slog for 12 hours in the farm so the, sir uh, were the conditions any better than the slave traders down there yeah the condition of labor whether they are in the south or the north remains the same that is within course wretched there's not much improvement there so the free labor of north cannot claim that they were much better off than the slave labor of the south in fact 
if we be very honest in our judgment, then the southern slave labor had much more security than the white laborers of the north, who were frequently retrenched and had to move from one place to the other, from pillar to post, in such a work. So they may be free, they have freedom of movement they had, or freedom to eat, or maybe at night they were at par with their masters, uh, dancing in the pubs or whatever, restaurants. So they had this kind of freedom, no doubt. But otherwise, otherwise, in the basics, basic needs of the life, they were no better off than the southern slaves. That is there. Only difference is that these people had wages, money wages. The southern slaves didn't have any wages. That was a big difference. And the northerners could vote. The southerners couldn't vote. They were not allowed to vote at all. So there are some differences. But on the whole, the condition of labor was the same, whether north or south. So that was the situation. The war over the issue of slavery was fought not with the sword, but with words. A battle of pamphlets ensued, in which each wanted to gain popularity by decrying and by othering the claim of the opposition. Particularly, there were the rabid anti-slavery men like William Lord Garrison, who established the Anti-Slavery Society in 1820. And he had a paper called The Liberator. In the first editorial he wrote, I will not listen, I will not equivocate, I will not excuse, and I will be heard. He would only criticize the institution of slavery, the peculiar institution. And he thought that he had so much moral power, messianic power, that he would be heard all over the nation. That was his claim. And he went on for quite some time for, for this campaign and from England he got some uh, backing from William Wilberforce, the evangelist. He also was the author of the abolition of slavery in India and also uh, he wanted to pass that message to the United States for the abolition of slavery. So in this way, Garrison had backing from England as well. So this was a very turbulent movement and Quite a few others also joined him, and they argued that slavery is unchristian against the norms of Christianity, of universal brotherhood. So it is uneconomic. You don't get the best out of labor of man. They are used as human beings. They are not given anything to think and improvise their laboring skill. So, sir, was there a fight purely humanist? Uh, I, I, I would say that uh, there was always some kind of ulterior motive behind, behind this anti-slavery movement. Basically, the North wanted to undermine the South on two counts. One was to undermine the slave economy because they thought that because of slave economy, South was getting an economic edge over the North. There was also a political motive. Political motive was ultimately to crush the slaveocracy, the slave aristocracy, the planter aristocracy of the South, and democratize the whole country. That would facilitate extension of free labor economy into the South and the democracy into the South. And ultimately, the northern uh, businessmen and uh, landowners they would prevail over the South they will virtually control the entire country. So the political uh, agenda was also very strong. And economically, they were afraid of the uh, slaves entering the north, undermining their free labor. Therefore, they would checkmate slaves at all costs. So I would think that uh, this was the main brunt of their movement, not so much humanitarian humanist. This was, the, this was is an interest at stake over which there was the fight. But then, whatever is the cause, we hide that in beautiful words and we make humanist agenda all the time. They criticize, not criticize like that, that they were unchristian, it was undemocratic, it was um, sort of uh, use of labor, which was 
uh, not blessed with any kind of ingenuity or skill. Labor was used only as beasts and not as human beings, not honing their talents in any way. So on all these counts, they attacked. And even they said that it is unconstitutional. Because you know, in the, in the United States, uh, when Jefferson drafted the Constitution, it was clearly written that all men are created equal. But if there is slavery, how can all men be created equal? That was not followed. So uh, the Northern campaigners, they maintained that it was also unconstitutional. Against that, the South also replied. They had also like David Christie and others who would say the whole world economy depended on uh, slaves because they ran the plantations. It had brought all the wealth to the United States. North had not produced enough for wealth. Marches had brought some goods, no doubt. But the main income of the United States at that time, in the pre-industrial period, was cotton. So they argued that we have brought prosperity to the United States. And this is precious as an institution. So slavery cannot be abolished. And they pointed out that uh, slave masters were the kind. There is hardly any difference between the democratic North and aristocratic South. In the name of democracy, the laborers were very much exploited in the North as well. And therefore, you cannot draw any kind of a difference between uh, the condition of labor in the North and condition of labor in the South. So they also replied, point, counterpoint. As to um, Christianity also, they said, OK, Jesus has said that you keep your flock in good humor. So mention of flock is there. And as for constitutionality, they say, well, all men are created equal. But at the same time, the Constitution, life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness or property was also maintained. So slaves being property and pursuit of happiness. So the uh, planters of the South had a right to maintain slaves, buy slaves and maintain slaves. So th these, you know, fusiliers, they came from both sides. They fought. And that really hotted up the situation. From here on, we proceed to the new factor of westward expansion. It upset the balance of both politics and economics and also increased confusion. The American land man ratio was favorable, no doubt. There was more land and less people. But gradually, the people settled in the north and the south on the eastern sea coast. They had point, point, uh, reached a point of complete um, overcrowding and they were bursting at the seams. They wanted to move ahead, this was one thing. Second, they were also in search of more opportunities. There were waves of immigrants coming from the old world. The old settlers were happy in the eastern seaboard, but the new settlers who came as fresh waves, they had no space. So they had to move to the Midwest or Far West, whether North or South, they had to move. So there's a hunt for more lands. And uh, true war, war also had a connection with this surging population. And uh, there were, um, one war was War of 1812. The other was the War of 1845 against Mexico. Through these wars, America had gained a lot of territory. Particularly War of 1845 against the weak government of Mexico, which they completely smashed, brought a lot of territory to the Southwest for America such territories like New Mexico, Utah, Arizona, Texas, and finally California. All these territories came to the United States. And these were peopled in no time by the fresh waves of settlers coming from the old world. They were peopled. After this has been achieved, these people wanted to push through the middle and through the northwest. And for this purpose, the, the 
geographical explorers like Livingstone and others were utilized, McCormick and others. And up the Mississippi and Missouri River, they had gone into the Oregon Territory. So Northwest uh, was also discovered. The prairies that were unfolded, and they discovered that land beyond the Mississippi and Missouri, which were considered to be the last frontier, was also very fertile, good for human population. Only the Red Indians were living there, they had to be pushed back. Otherwise, there was to be no war. One could move. Now, there was a mad rush to go to these new lands. The balance that was maintained through the Compromise of 1850, drawing a line, artificial line of 36 degrees 30 minutes, dividing north and south. To the south of this line, there would be slave states, and to the north of this line, there would be free states. That was the Compromise of 1850. But because of this mad exodus of people moving from east to west, they did not honor this Missouri Compromise anymore. And following the trail of the geographical explorers, they went into, went actually berserk into these new areas. And that really compounded the confusion. And many of them had slaves also. So they wanted to take the slaves into the new territory, which they technically called free soil territory, free soil area. So they carried their slaves from the south, from the east also, particularly southeast, they were carrying the slaves into the new area. And they flouted that uh, border line. And the result was, which was described in American textbooks as the story of bleeding Kansas and bloody Nebraska. They entered into this, through the night, through the forest, they traveled with all their goods in perambulator and babies in, tied up in their backs, they moved on. Whoever had horses, they were advantageous. They rode their horses. In this way, they entered into the new soil, free soil area. That really rang the alarm, what to do with this. Now, this was to be put off immediately. Something, something had to be settled. Somewhere, some, some compromise had to be made. But it was very difficult for any new compromise to come. So after 1850, they tried another compromise in 1858, by which the balance was to be maintained. They said that the problem could be, political problem could be solved in this way. Whenever a new state would be born in the West and would join the American Union, they have to come in a pair. If one slave state was coming, it would be matched by a free state, so that the balance was maintained. So that was the argument. But that was political solution. But the main solution didn't come. Whether the slaves would get into the free territory or not, that question was not solved. Slave states were coming and free states were coming, but nevertheless, the slaves were going into the free area. A main threat was that if the slaves really entered into the new area, they undersell the poor white labor. And also, the oligarchy of the South would pervade in the North, and American democracy would be undermined. So the poor whites protested against this, and the champions, Democrats, champions of democracy in the North they were also afraid of this prospect that southern economic and political system might pervade the North, the free democratic system of the North. And they wanted industry to be established. But if the South entered North, it would be totally agrarian, which was against their will. They wanted to see America as a democratic, 
free industrial America. So that dream, dream would be shattered. So it was this basic fight between an agrarian America versus an industrial America, between a olig an oligarchy, aristocratic government and a democratic government, unfree labor, slave labor versus free labor. So these were the dichotomies actually. These were the dichotomies. And all these because of the entry of new states with and people coming with slaves into the new area. Something had to be done. At this juncture emerged Abraham Lincoln. He had a humble origin and rose from county politics to state legislature politics and finally into national politics. He was catapulted into national politics because of his championship of anti-slavery issues. In 1960, Lincoln won the presidential election handsomely and became the 16th president of the United States of America. And the South feared that if Lincoln won the election in 1860, he would abolish slavery and enforce the northern free economy and democracy on the South. Most of the planters of the South would lose their plantation. This would be absolutely losing their own bread. That's the news that he has won, led to the secession of seven American southern states from the American Union, led by Georgia, Virginia, North Carolina, South Carolina, Florida, Texas, and all these states. They came out of the American Union, formed their southern uh, confederacy, and raised the banner of revolt. They became a separate country. When Lincoln took the oath as president, he clearly pointed out that America was one. There was only one union. There could be two states, two free countries in the same soil. So since the majority of the states still wanted America to be a free America, so the federal troops would go to the south to punish all those seceded states and bring them back into the American Union. He had to declare that. But the provocation had come from the south because they had seceded already. They didn't even wait for what Lincoln was going to do. And therefore Lincoln had no option also but to send troops. So the civil war came because of the great sectional conflict. Call it anti-slavery conflict, but basically it was a sectional conflict. Troops were sent and civil war went on for quite some time. So if somebody asks whether the civil war was fought for abolition of slavery, my answer would be no. It was basically a sectional conflict of two systems of political economy, as beautifully described by same man, Eugene Genovese, in his other classic work, The Political Economy of Slavery. There he has delineated the whole question. The fundamental thing in, the sta uh, in stake was the system of political economy that America was going to espouse. And most of the Americans visualized that America would ultimately become an industrial America, democratic industrial America, of free labor. They wanted it to happen. In the conclusion, therefore, I would emphasize, I would take the point from you that it was not a great battle for freedom, uh, for, 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 for um, emancipation so much. Not so much a question of humanism, that was there. A basic thing was to determine what was the character of American political economy. So North triumphed, Lincoln triumphed, means that the Northern capitalist, democratic, free economy triumphed, ultimately. So he, he was in that role, a catalytic role for Lincoln, though his name has not been uh, associated with the, what I'm saying now. He has been called the great emancipator of the slaves. And he himself says in the preamble to the uh, proclamation of emancipation in 1863, if my name ever goes down in history for any of my good works, it must be 
this one, that is emancipation of slaves. But that was not the main thing. He ensured that there was this kind of free, democratic, capitalist, industrial economy, ultimately, to succeed in America. And he was so very futuristic that modern America is only that kind of democratic, free, industrial America. And slavery has vanished. Slavery has been abolished. All these slaves of the South, they could move about all over the United States. They became freed labor, freed labor. And they had to compete with the poor white labor now, everywhere. But then it was crisscross. The northern white, poor white laborers were also now going into the south to claim good jobs in Texas, in California, had a lot of jobs. And there was a gold rush. All these people madly went into that area. So the northern free labor wanted a labor market. They got it. The southern labor, slave labor wanted a market in the north. They also got it. Now the present century, we have a black president, Barack Obama. His forefathers must have been a slave from the south. Now, the country had been so much democratized that even the country had a black president for the first time. They only are waiting for a woman president, and they're also waiting for a black woman president, ultimately, as the triumph of democracy. We have to end on this note. Thank you for your discussion. In this episode, our discussion on sectional conflict started with the discussion on the great economic divide between the slave economy in the South and the free labor economy of the North. We have also discussed the political conflict between champions of slavery in the South and those of democracy in the North. Thereafter, we discussed the battle of pamphlets over the anti-slavery movement in the North and the reply from the South. Then we proceeded to the new factor of westward expansion, which upset the balance of both politics and economics in the nation, and discussed how confusion was confounded. After that, we had a section on the compromise of 1850, to create a balance and its failure leading to the civil war and then the emergence of Abraham Lincoln as the president in 1861, the cessation of the seven southern states, the civil war when federal troops were sent by President Lincoln into the south and all the seven states were defeated in the war and brought back into the Union of America. And finally, we discussed the proclamation of abolition of slavery in 1863.